we got to talk about neuratinib, okay? Because, you know, there's going to be some, um, you know, we're going to change what we've been doing with that. So the Exonet trial showed that women who, um, you know, the overall trial was positive with a 2.5% improvement in invasive disease-free survival, giving one year of neuratinib after finishing up your year of trastuzumab. And you didn't want to wait too long. If you started within a year, you had a better outcome than waiting, you know, with a year off of everything. But if you started it, and then you took your year of neuratinib, 240 milligrams, um, you know, daily, with prophylaxis against diarrhea, of course, you know, which is the loperamide, the cholesterol is looking really, really good. But in the ER positive population, it was a larger delta mm -hmm. of 5% that really held up over time. Mm -hmm. At San Antonio this year, Michael Gannant and Frankie Holmes have a nice poster looking at the one-third of patients in Extinet who had had preoperative therapy, had residual disease, and then who were randomized, and the delta is even bigger there because you're enriching for those, mm -hmm. and this is in the I ER positive. It was in the ER positive, okay? Mm -hmm. It was big. It was like eight percentage point absolute improvement, mm -hmm. you know, there. So that's pretty good, mm -hmm. you know? So in the ER negative disease, ER negative HER2 positive, initially there were those data where the curves came apart, and then it would look pretty good for a while, and then they came back together as soon as the patients stopped the therapy, but there was a poster at ASCO this year that looked specifically at patients who's with ER negative um, HER2 positive disease that start within six months of finishing up their trastuzumab. The curve split apart, it was two and a half percent, and they stayed apart, okay? So it didn't come right back. So lesser magnitude of benefit, but at least it made, it made more sense, you know, that it main, maintained, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe if you enriched as well, you know, for patients that had preoperative therapy, still had considerable residual disease with ER negative HER2 positive, you know, the, the, you know, the higher the risk, you know, the, the, the hazard ratio will translate into a greater absolute benefit. So let's just talk about, let's just go through each, each of us. Now we're going to be using um, TDM1 mm -hmm. for patients who don't have a PATH, path CR um, because TDM was, was studied just in that population that fits our current practice. We're giving mostly TDM1. Uh, we're mostly giving preoperative therapy to the high-risk patients. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to finish up the, the TDM1, and then mm, patients are on endocrine therapy. Who are you going to think about neuratinib you know, for recognizing it's a lot of therapy, but recognizing the stakes are very, very high, of course? You know? So how about you, Aditya? I think if I look at the subset analysis of Extinet, the biggest benefit was seen in the ER positive, HER2 positive setting. And coming back to what Heather was saying earlier, that patients can have later recurrence, especially the tumors that are ER positive and HER2 mm -hmm. positive. So if you just focus at three-year disease-free survival or five-year disease-free survival, that might not be sufficient, especially for that group. So if I have a young patient with ER positive, HER2 positive disease, that is a patient I would consider neuratinib even after TDM1. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about you, Ruth? Well, so, I mean, as you know, I'm a big believer in this crosstalk between the HER2 and ER pathways. And as Adam alluded to earlier, I mean, I think the fact that there's a subset of ER positive, HER2 positive cancers that are luminal A is a very important thing to take into account. Now, we don't have that from Extinet, but I do think that, just like uh, Aditya said, I, I mean, I think if I had somebody that was high risk that was ER positive, HER2 positive, I would talk about neuratinib, even if they had TDM1. Yeah. To stop the crosstalk. Right. So have you been giving it after trastuzumab, pertuzumab, because Extinet doesn't address that population. Well, we're so, but we're not using that anymore. Be, but so it's going to be ER positive with substantial, because remember, 50% of the ER positives are going to have residual disease. So it's a question of But it speaks to your beliefs about whether or not you think it's rele relevant therapy for your high risk, particularly ER positive patients, right. because if that is true, that you believe even after HP, someone warrants neuratinib, that same argument should carry over to the TDM1 it treated will. patient. And for me, it will. I think yeah. that RCB2 or 3 definitely, with ER positive RCB2 or 3, will get both TDM1 for a year and then neuratinib for a year. Again, no more pertuzumab after. Years. I like this. <laughs> that's what I would do. I don't this. know what you guys I would do. I like it. Would you, what, what would you guys but do? What would you that's have? exactly mm -hmm. what I would do. But mm -hmm. I think time will tell. I mean, experience, we need the experience under our belt, too, to see what patients can actually tolerate. Because we yes, are talking about yeah. maybe ACTHP neoadjuvant therapy and then TDM1 after that for 14 cycles and then a year of neuratinib. That's a lot of treatment. It's a lot of, so, a lot of treatment. Ooh, we have, and we have some, some experience. Because 
when, by the time Exonet came out, the standard of care had changed. It now included pertuzumab. So we had to take that leap of faith that there's non-cross resistance, you know, by hitting the tyrosine kinase end of HER2 and doing pan HER2, not letting escape to the HER2. But we kind of, that made sense to us. And there are data in the metastatic setting in patients who had had HP, who had had Cleopatra-like mm -hmm. taxane, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, who then received in phase two trial TDM1 plus neuratinib. Very, very active, very high response rates, higher than you'd see with either one alone, suggesting that after pertuzumab, neuratinib was adding. You know what I mean? Again, right. inferential, but we made that leap, and, you know, albeit we're going to have to make the same leap with Catherine because it's only a small percentage that had the pertuzumab. So, but now we're making two leaps, you know, that neuratinib would be non cross resistant with both pertuzumab and TDM1, you know. Um, and, but talk a little bit about this crosstalk, you know, that kind of is persuasive to you, um, Ruth. Well, you know, there's quite a lot of preclinical data saying that if you block the HER2 pathway, the ER pathway becomes more active and vice versa. So biologically, I think the results of Exonet actually make sense where you're basically, by in the placebo arm where you're taking away the HER2 inhibition, you're allowing that to act as a resistance mechanism. And biologically, I think that makes some sense. I would like if we knew whether they were luminal A or luminal B that were benefiting. I don't think we'll ever get really get that data. Um, so that's kind of what, what, what I think makes the most sense in terms of this. What's interesting, though, is why the tyrosine kinase inhibitor worked, but trastuzumab didn't work in that setting. But you would assume that, you know, the fact that they've been on trastuzumab for a while, maybe some of them were resistant. So that's, that's my thought. I don't know if it's true. It's totally a hypothesis. And, you know, we're trying to work to do a trial where we would actually give a couple of weeks of just uh, either endocrine therapy or her 2 direct therapy for these triple positive cancers and kind of see what happens to the other p pathway. I think that's the way that you would actually address that. Yeah. Makes you think about you know neuratinib plus good endocrine therapy up front, you know, as 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 a possi possibility. But it's interesting. I think we're all kind of on the same page with that, and that's going to really bring hopefully the the, the um, long term disease free survival rates up even even higher um, in this in this disease. And and then hope, hopefully there'll be some some de escalation to maybe at the, at the lower risk end of things. But in the higher risk, we have more and more tools certainly. So that's. It sure makes you wonder what to do in the first line setting for metastatic disease then yeah. after somebody has been exposed to HP and then TDM1. Hopefully there won't be a lot of people. <laughs> Which yeah. we have found. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. Exactly. And it may be a while, maybe a while. So go back to your Cleopatra. Go back to your Cleopatra. Right. Go back to your, go back to your, your that, that's, a, that's a really exactly. good you know, point that actually yeah. I have to say I hadn't thought about. What, what do you do for those patients now? But if we're down now to one in 20, you know, we're now 95% or 90, over 90%, mm -hmm. five to 10 year DFS, you know, hopefully it'll be rare. It takes a long time to have. Yeah.